Well, good afternoon. Yeah, I should have let that play out. That's kind of awesome. I hope you all appreciate that we, um, we, we provided insights into the design or ideas into the design of this building to go well with the artwork for the, uh, the show this week. So I hope you, hope you all liked that, that uh, these angles match so well. My name's, as uh, Waldo said, Jeff Allen, and I'm, uh, I've been about 20 years in marketing as a career. And in that time, I've always tried to use data to inform the way I've done the work I do. So whether I'm designing a piece of creative or I'm trying to come up with a, a great idea for a campaign or some great messaging, uh, I'm always trying to find ways to use data. And um, often, especially as we measure the performance of the work we do, we find ourselves using data and, uh, and sometimes struggling to, u to, to convey what we see in the data as people who are every day in the campaign and, and in the everyday um, work of, of the marketing work we're doing, sometimes it's hard to connect the dots for your audience around what you're trying to say you're seeing in the data. And so I wanted to take some time today and show uh, perhaps some ways that I, that, uh, that I could help you with that. But I wanted to start by talking about what it means, first of all, to even be data-driven. So um, by show of hands, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to take a quick survey here. Um, if, uh, if a one, I'm going to ask you to rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, okay? One is, I'm totally uncomfortable with data. I don't like it. It confuses me, and I prefer not to use it. I'm more, much more comfortable in colors and pictures, which is kind of me a little bit. Uh, and then a 10 is, I love data. I'm a data scientist. I have a PhD. Uh, everybody who knows me knows that uh, I'm all about the data, and I'm really, uh, I'm really sophisticated in my use of data. How many ones in the audience? Okay, twos, threes, four, five. Now we're going to get to the really data-driven people. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so the biggest group were eights, but believe it or not, the distribution is really broad. So we have a really, really broad uh, range of people. Now, how many have ever put a slide up in front of an audience with a bar chart or a pie chart. Okay, because if you haven't, this might not be the right presentation for you. But I think most of us have. And um, how many of you have ever been in a presentation where, uh, or in a meeting where everybody's talking about their opinions about how to do something? And um, then someone at the other end of the table says, would anyone like to hear what the data says? Anyone seen that? Been in that experience? I think there's some people in the US with the election that just happened who surprised by what the data is saying today compared to what it was saying earlier in the week. Well, the problem with uh, that meeting, and those meetings happen, happen all the time, is that they're, um, people are working with their opinions. And um, with your opinions, you're usually guessing. And I would argue that guessing is the most expensive thing marketers do. When you make guesses, you're wrong sometimes, you're right sometimes, and every time you're wrong in marketing, you're losing money. And so um, this is my favorite quote. I actually used it here in this same venue two years ago to talk a little bit about this idea. But when we talk about analytics and the use of data, which is everywhere, we have to understand that opinions are the, are the enemy of analytics and of data. But there's data everywhere, right? So we have access to all kinds of data about our customers, where we're interacting with them. We see them on mobile devices. We see them on websites. We see them in uh, retail environments. We see them through the Internet of Things and video. And all this data is, at, is accessible to us. And the question is, what do we do with it? Now, for many of you, you do analytics as part of what you do. And, um, and so you would say you're data driven. But the question I want to pose is, simply because you have data and even use data, does that mean you're you're data-driven at an advanced level. So let me show you something you're all familiar with. Did you guys know, I don't know if all of you knew this, but you've had a real-time dashboard in your life from the, probably the time you were born. There's a real-time dashboard that's been in your life. Um, in fact, it's in your car that uh, tells you how you're performing against this KPI of the speed limit. So when you get in your car to go somewhere, uh, you can look at this KPI. You see the KPIs are posted all around town. You can see how fast you're supposed to go, and then you have your real-time dashboard to compare how you're performing against that KPI. 
Now, if someone in your business worked this way, would you say that, is, that person is a model data-driven person? They look at data, and then they measure, and they, they, they go after that KPI. Are they data-driven? They're definitely data-driven, um, but uh, are they ideal? Are they a model? Maybe. So here's the question you have to ask is, what, to what end are they doing this? To what end are they following this KPI? If you got in that car to drive 50 kilometers an hour, and you watched that speedometer, and you drove 50 kilometers an hour, then yeah, sure, you, uh, you were data-driven. But no one gets in a car to go 50 kilometers an hour, right? You get in a car to go somewhere, right? And in fact, some of the places we go, we have to get there at a certain time. If we don't get there at a certain time, there are penalties, right? There's a price to pay. If you have plane tickets and you arrive at the airport an hour after the plane leaves, that's not a good thing, right? You have not, you've not um, been data-driven enough. But it's not enough. The speed, speedometer alone doesn't tell me everything I know to get to the airport on time. There are other factors, right? I have the status of the vehicle, um, and speed is one of those things. But if I have no gas in the car, or if I have a flat tire, then... Um, I need to know those things, too, or I'm not going to achieve my KPI, right? Again, my KPI in this case is get to the airport on time. Now, as I move from left to right here, I start to do more advanced things. Now I have a plan, and I'm executing against it. I want to check my status. How am I doing? Am I on time? Am I behind? And then I want to look at the conditions that are going to affect my ability to get there. So we look at uh, travel conditions, uh, construction and traffic and weather. Ultimately, we even start to make uh, decisions sometimes aided now by modern cars, about how we might get there in a different way if we're encountering things that are going to slow us down. Now, this, this right here is a really simple model. To most of us, we don't even think about this as being anything advanced. But this kind of rigor rarely exists in our businesses. Moving from what to who to why to so what as we move from the use of KPIs and measurement against those KPIs all the way through to executing on our goals. If you are a retailer, an online retailer, you could see that this, this same way. So if you're fixated on visitors and page views and cart abandon rates, you're stuck in the speedometer and the fuel level, uh, level of maturity and how you're using data. Right? So the goal here is to move from left to right and start to understand how do your, how do your customers actually progress along their journey? What is the path they take? Where are they on that path? And, uh, and how can I drive them more efficiently down the path? How do I also understand when things are breaking down? Are there anomalies in the data that tell me that we slow down the process somewhere along the line? Or maybe we're, we're even better than we expected. So how do we capitalize on positive anomalies right? when we're doing better than plan? Um, and so these, uh, all these different things help us move, as you can see, from a relatively low level of maturity in our use of data to a high level of maturity. This is, a, this is another view of the same thing, and it kind of speaks to the kind of work you do in an analytics tool or in your analytics practice. If you're constantly exploring data and spending all your time visualizing the data, you're going to be way down in this, um, this kind of low maturity level of analytics. But as you can move further out to the right and find insights and take action on those insights, now you start to, you're starting to drive value for your organization. By the way, there is no ROI in insights. You can produce all the insights you want. There's no value to that in that to your organization until you take action. So you have to get at least to the action step. Sophisticated organizations are going further than that, and they're saying, hey, we keep finding the same insights in the same channels and taking the same action. So how do we automate some of those things so that as soon as we see a hint of that insight again, we know exactly what to do? and we skip right to it, and then programmatically automate that action, ultimately to drive results. So this is, this is really a way to think about where you are with your use of analytics and how you're using data. Now, for uh, many of us, we, have, we, we see data as a way to advance our careers. So what I want to do is I want to shift gears now and talk about how um, perhaps the way you use data, broadly now speaking, um, not just specifically in analytics, could be enhanced um, with a few tips. And um, I believe that if you can get better in the way you use data, you can move uh, up the ladder in your career, which uh, who doesn't want that? Does everybody kind of think it would be a good idea to 
advance in their career, anyone where they wanted to be, you want to retire right where you are? Okay, you, sir, probably have a happy life. <laughs> That's awesome. For the rest of us, <laughs> uh, we, need to, we need to keep getting better at what we do. And so these are some things that, I, that I've seen as, uh, as I've been able to work with a lot of the biggest brands in the world. We travel all around the world, and we hear what really cool brands are doing uh, in the, their use of data, and we're seeing what really smart people are doing. And you're going to be surprised. Uh, for the next few minutes, this might start to feel somewhat tactical, but I can tell you, um, even after I pr produced this presentation, I started to see some of these practices absent in my work. And so um, while some of these are intuitive, many of them are things that we have to keep reminding ourselves to do in order to advance the way um, we use data and, and how that can enhance what our organizations are doing. And the first thing I want to talk about is this idea of democratizing insights. What I mean by democratizing insights is make insights available to everybody. Um, and I'll illustrate this with this picture. So a couple of years ago, my family, we had a family gathering, and um, my, my daughter and I uh, were representing my family, and we brought, um, we brought a plate of cookies. So we actually, it was a bag of cookies, and I gave my daughter the, the, the bag and a plate, and she went and she prepared them, and she set, up, set them up with the pink ones on the one, on the one side and the white ones on the other side. And, um, and she was really excited about these, and all the little kids came running, and they wanted them. She said, no, no, no. Wait till I get it just how I want. She separated the cookies and, 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 uh, and guarded them until it was time. And when she was ready, then she opened the gates and presented the cookies to everybody. Notice the look on her face, right? She, she's really proud of the fact that she's giving this gift to everybody else there. Well, unfortunately, in a lot of our organizations, we have people who feel like this about data. Right? They hold on to all the data. They want to package it up just how they want it. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But they hold back too much. And then they only give anyone data when they're ready to give them data. And that's, that's someone who's a problem, actually. Right? They're a problem because they're hoarding data. Does this idea make sense? Like, it's not good to hoard data, right? Is there anybody in the organization that could not benefit from having data? If you think about it, there really isn't. Everybody could do their job better if they had more data. And so um, I want to invite you to look for these people. And if you are one of these people, knock it off. <laughs> and if you see these people, help them understand that their value is not in being the gatekeeper of the data, but actually in being the person who makes sure that data is always going out the gate, going out the gates, and getting into the hands of people who can do their jobs better. If you manage someone like this, I would recommend uh, giving them a KPI to measure how many people do they serve? How many people in the organization do they send data to on a regular basis? And then that'll help, you, help them think about how they can advance their career by growing that from 10 customers internally to 20 to 50 to 100 and so on. And that'll be good for your organization. Now, to help make that easier, um, we've been doing some things in our product, in Adobe Analytics, and uh, to help you understand how we thought about this problem, um, I, I want to use a little metaphor. When we undertook to build a product that made it easier to share data, we, we thought about this uh, museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. Anyone ever been to the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg? One, two, four or five of you. Great. So for the rest of you, uh, this is a beautiful museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, um, called the State Hermitage Museum. It was founded in 1764 by Catherine the Great. And uh, anyone ever been to the Louvre in Paris? OK. Does anyone feel like they saw every inch of the Louvre and still had time left over at the end of their day? <laughs> OK. By comparison, this, is, this museum is about three and a half times as big as the Louvre. OK? So it's a massive, massive museum covering multiple buildings. Uh, there are two of the 10 known uh, paintings by Leonardo da Vinci here. Uh, there's a Michelangelo sculpture, a famous one called Crouching Boy that's in this museum. Two Madonnas by Raphael. Uh, 13 Rembrandts, you'll be happy to know, are, are here. Or maybe not happy, I don't know <laughs> how you feel about where Rembrandts. And there's a Van Gogh here. And so many of the great uh, artists' works 
are in this museum. Now, if we, uh, if we drill in here, uh, you can see one of the buildings in the complex, and we're going to slice the floor open, and uh, I want to take a look at this room right here. So you see four chambers here, and um, I'm going to give you a job. So you no all now have a new job. You work for me, and we're going to go curate the artwork that's going to go in this room. So how would we do that? How would we get started? Well, um, we're not going to use anything that's already in the collection, okay? We're going to start new. And the cool thing is, in addition to all the artwork that they have on permanent display in the museum, they also have an eight-building restoration and storage facility that houses another 3.1 million items. So we'll get in a car, dra travel about 10 kilometers from the Hermitage Museum to this facility called Staraya Drevnya. If any of you speak Russian, it just means old, old forest. What? Village. village, old village. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> so we go, we go to the old village. Uh, it's not old. It's a beautiful, modern building. And um, what's really cool, what they've done here, you, you know, if I told you, they, hey, there's a warehouse in St. Petersburg, and it's got 13 million things, you'd kind of think, oh, I'm probably going to see crates, piles and piles of crates. That's not what they've done here. They have this open storage philosophy, and you can see they have these um, these walls that can accordion open so that they can hang all these pieces. So someone can go through and you can literally go see many of these. They actually have carriages, like great big carriages in, in some of these containers on display. So it's a really great thing. So we can go through there and we can think about it. But still, 3.1 million items is, uh, is overwhelming. So what I thought I'd do is I'd, um, I was going to get Mikhail Piotrovsky, who is the curator of the museum. He wasn't available, so he gave me some advice to give to you. So here's what he said to say. He said, getting started is going to be paralyzing. So focus on a specific category, okay? Pick a genre, pick a time frame, maybe pick a, 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 a historical story, and then um, think about how you can tell a story around what you're doing. So storytelling will help enhance the way you, you craft this. Um, and think about aesthetics, okay? Aesthetics are going to matter a lot. So think about how you want to paint the walls, perhaps how you want to cover the floors. Think about lighting, okay? And, um, you know, interaction is really key. So some of the best modern museums are very hands-on. They're really, you know, you can touch and feel and experience. This uh, museum we're in today, or this space we're in today, has some interactive uh, exhibits as well. And so you see that. So this is the advice he would likely give you. Now, it turns out everything I've said um, is true of the experience you have if you use Adobe Analytics. You go in there, and you're going to find millions of combinations of data, of metrics and dimensions and segments, and hundreds of reports and dashboards if you've been around for a little while. right? And, um, and you could feel like it's the open storage philosophy there, too. You can go in, and you can look at all kinds of things in there. And you might not have any idea what you're seeing, but you're seeing a lot of stuff. And so that same advice is the advice we would give our customers too. And we created a, a, a product experience that mimics this. In fact, it gives you canvases where you can drag and drop visualizations in to tell your story with data. This, space, this, this product is called Analysis Workspace, by the way, and hopefully a lot of you have been using it. We shipped it uh, over a year ago. Um, and then you can create these workspaces for any audience internal to your organization. So you can have many, many of these workspaces. And each one allows you to drag in. As you can see, these have just been dragged in and tuned. They're all interactive, and they can be shared uh, with people um, across the organization. So if you're an Adobe Analytics customer, you should be using this. And think about it in the context of this museum metaphor that I've shown you. All right, now shifting gears a little bit, let's get a little, let's zoom out and talk a little less specifically about Adobe, and I'm going to give you five tips. The first tip is tell the story, whatever story it is, or explain your concept at a sixth grade level. So if you don't know, sixth graders are about 11, 12 years old, okay? So you want to speak about that level. Um, here's an example. This is timely because of what's, uh, what's just happened in the United States. So if I have to explain pure democracy to someone, and I want to do it in a really simple way. Two cows give us a nice, uh, a nice way to do this. How does pure democracy work with two cows? 
you have two cows, you and your neighbors vote to decide who gets the milk, okay? That's what the uh, Americans did yesterday. We voted on who gets the milk. I don't even know what that means, but uh, uh, socialism, okay? You have two cows, your neighbor has zero, you give one to your neighbor. Communism, two cows, the state takes both and gives you a job on the farm and gives you some milk, okay? You guys are unusually quiet. Is this making someone uncomfortable? <laughs> Fascism. You have two cows. The state takes both and sells you some milk. All right. Traditional capitalism works a little differently, right? So now we're going to move from government to, to economic uh, constructs. In traditional capitalism, you have two cows. You sell one, buy a bull, you, your herd multiplies, and the milk production grows, and you sell your dairy and retire on the income. Now, um, how many of you, uh, is there, I don't know if there's a big startup community around here. Are there a lot of uh, s technology startups? One of the things that technology startups uh, tend to do is they tend to be um, a little loose in how they spend their money, and they sometimes do uh, goofy things. So if I'm explaining how venture capital works, which is generally the funding source for technology startups, this is how venture capitalism works. This is, again, think of me talking to my 11-year-old son so, son, you have an idea for a new flavor of milk, and you need some money to create and launch it. So you get your uncle and two of his poker buddies to loan you $50 million in exchange for a piece of your empire at some future date. Then you buy 100 cows, hire 300 people, and start giving away free milk to people if they'll publicly say how great your milk is. Then, of course, like any good startup, you plaster milk testimonials on billboards with catchy slogans promoting your disruptive dairy innovation, because it's important you have to expand what you're doing. Um, and then you value your 100 cows at the equivalent price of 2,000 cows because you've created a new dairy goods platform. Because that's what, by the way, when you come to conferences like this, vendors like Adobe and everybody else, we got to talk about the platform, right? Platforms are bigger. They're, they're more important. They're more valuable. So you have to have a milk platform. And then, of course, at the end, you sell the whole thing to a grocery store chain and move to a private island. So that's a simple way, simple way to explain what sometimes are complex concepts. Another simple way, I showed you this graphic at the beginning, and I, and I illustrated sort of the world with data over it. And this is, a, this is a, an art piece that I was able to collaborate with a great artist named Josh Rossi on. And, uh, and we used it to create this world where we could talk about what happens in analytics. And then we designed it so we could turn around in the world, and we could see all of you the customer, using our stuff. And in fact, you can't, um, if you look closely, you'll see that the people in this um, building look like an organization chart with the senior people at the top, and then they get more junior as you come down. And if we zoom in, we can actually go learn about any of these particular roles, and we can even flip around and show how the software works. So think of ways to take boring, sometimes, concepts like analytics and put them in a context that everybody understands. Metaphors and analogies are great for that, right? Because you know you have a common vocabulary. Um, so that's uh, tip number one. Tell the story at a sixth grade level. My next tip is to communicate visually, and I'll go through this one quickly. But these are just some great charts that they've given a little more context to by putting them um, in a real-world context. So is this expensive to get a couple of pencils and stick them in the dirt? Doesn't have to be, right? I am guarantee these guys paid some money for this from a brilliant agency. Maybe some of you worked for this agency. Um, but simple concepts, not necessarily expensive to implement, but really clever ways to communicate what they're saying. This is a lot better than anything you can create in Excel for communicating a message, right? Here's another bar chart, OK? This one has a couple of data dimensions, which is interesting. Look at this one. You have to chew a little bit of gum for this one, but not again, not a high budget piece. You maybe sacrifice some shoes. I really like this one as well. So really, um, think about how can I communicate beyond Excel charts, right? How can I communicate beyond the standard pie charts and bar charts? Can you roll out some paper in a crosswalk to create a bar chart? Um, now, th another thing that's really helpful are infographics. But infographics a lot of times overwhelm us, right? Because you've got to get some special visual style, and sometimes you have to call an agency for that. Well, 
Um, Adobe Stock is full of these things. There are digital artists all over the world that create these, and they're really uh, inexpensive to license on Adobe Stock. And then you can completely customize these things with colors and, and any kind of words. That's communicate visually. Next, tell me what to think. So too often we put up data in front of people, and we give them, it's like this. We say, do you see? See what I'm trying to talk about here? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And you're, you know, people are looking at it going, I don't know what, what am I supposed to put together out of this, right? So put it together for people. Assemble your data into some kind of story. And then don't make them guess. Tell them what to think. Again, um, can you guys see the point of this? You see what I'm trying to say with this, bi this um, donut chart here up there in the middle? It's a, it's a really important uh, point I want to make, right? We do this all the time to people. We put up a slide. There's 70 things on it. No one knows what to think. Are these, is 3% is good or bad, right? If you take just a few seconds and make the, red, the bad things red, the good things green, you're better off, okay? Unfortunately, some of us can't help ourselves, and we put so much color in there <laughs> that now we're back where we started again, right? Here's another thing. Um, when the data dips below a line, don't make me guess why, right? It, maybe there's, a, there's a, a perfectly normal reason, like it was a holiday, but maybe there's some, some other thing at play. And just tell me right off. Don't, don't, uh, don't put that in your talk track. Put that in your slide. Same with a gap like you see here on the right side. Spell it out for me. Don't make me kind of follow over and try and guess, okay, about how far apart did those things get. Benchmarks are helpful too. So nobody knows what any of these triangles coming out of the center of this kind of funky pie chart mean or what a 1.7 on strategy is. But if I could just give you the context of what other people like you have seen, you can see, oh, okay, on the right side, a 1.5 is um, at the top of the laggard range, the bottom of the average range. Okay, so something simple like that. Um, also, include your goals, right? So you generally, for any metric you show, you have a place where you'd like to be. So go ahead and put that in. And if you have data to show how your goals compare to maybe your competitors, that's even better, right? I don't know if a 1.3, was that the right goal? Um, but as soon as I see that it's better than a competitor, now I can kind of understand a lot better why we set that goal and how we're performing. This is another thing we do all the time in marketing is we just show like a point in time, like revenue is 1.4 billion, right? Um, and, uh, and so instead of doing that, put it in a trended view, and now we see 1.4 billion in a real context. Again, though, with some of the prior tips, label the bottom, so where did we come from? And you know, be nice to know where we were trying to go, so here I'm layering in the target, and then finally, how much better is that? So notice that's this versus that prior slide. A lot, more, uh, a lot more useful and a lot more helpful for the audience. It didn't really take me a lot longer to do this versus saying 1.4. Okay, so that's tell me what to think. Two more, aligning metrics to your corporate objectives. So all of us work for organizations that do planning at the very top level, at least every year, and they set goals. And there aren't a lot of them usually, four, five, six key goals. And so um, this is what that usually could look like for most organizations. And the challenge is, how, do, how does the organization execute around those goals? Uh, a perfect organization would do something like this, right? The goals would be distributed down, and everyone would always be doing something around one of those corporate objectives. If um, you could buy stock in this organization, it kind of doesn't matter whether those are the right priorities. If everybody's marching together and doing those things, this is probably going to be a successful organization. So as you think about any work you're doing, make sure you map it back, right? Show that, hey, these three things we're measuring, we're measuring them and we're doing them because they're part of this strategic objective up at the top level. And anytime you can make those connections and make those mappings, that's going to make you more valuable to the organization. That's going to make it more obvious where, where you fit in. So that's aligning to the corporate objectives. And then the last one is this idea of a composite metric. So a composite metric um, or, uh, or an index is something like um, the consumer price index or um, in the United States uh, stock market, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So it's a, it's a, it's a weighted average, essentially, of multiple metrics. And if you, if you uh, think at a really simple level, that's just taking the key metrics that matter, 
giving them weightings and turning that into a single score that everybody can understand. This is a great way to get the whole organization thinking about one thing and going after one thing together. So with all those things, that was kind of rapid fire there at the end. Um, I want to invite you to think about these five questions as you think about how mature you are in your use of data. Take a look at these and ask yourself, am I good at recognizing patterns or breaks in my patterns? Am I better known for the insights I discover? Or do I tend to go out and look for my ideas in the data? Do I look for data to support my ideas? Am I good at advocating for my ideas? Do I explain things I want to do? And by the way, nothing helps you get an idea sold better than pointing it back to or tying it back to a corporate initiative. When someone asks the wrong question, do you answer that question? Or do you help them understand the question they should have asked and answer that? And finally, do you tend to look for the story and the data, as I said earlier, or do you just go around looking for data uh, to tell your story? So with that, I think we might have time for half a question. <laughs> We've gone just a little bit over, but um, happy to take any questions anyone might have. Fully see them. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Great, thank you. I was really you. inspired. I'm definitely going to look at my own internal reporting a little bit different. And uh, fantastic, I like the, the Russian pronunciation as well. Yeah, so yeah. Really you time. know, if I can do anything, I can show you. I got a word Russian word wrong. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you, Jeff. Job well done.